Greetings uh, from Costa Rica. I'm uh, Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, uh, CEO of the Global Environmental Facility, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to this uh, session on building net zero nature positive economies, economy, uh, which is part of the 2021 uh, Davos Agenda Week uh, organized uh, by the World uh, Economic Forum. Uh, this morning, as I was preparing myself as your moderator, I come to realize that the last time I traveled outside my country, Costa Rica, was uh, January 2020 to Tapos. It's been a, a year. Uh, I, I, I took a plane, I traveled outside my, my country, and probably the same situation with everybody who's joining us today. It's, it has been an incredibly complicated uh, year, and I look forward for 2021 to be the, the year that we can bring um, our economies, our societies uh, much better, and we can be all together be able to work on the green, blue, uh, clean, resilient effort so we can be doing much better in the incoming uh, decades. Uh, the event for today is uh, we'll have a 30 minute session that uh, will be packed uh, with insights uh, from a panel in which I'm honored to be joined by uh, the EU Commissioner for Environment, uh, Mr. Sinkabishus, uh, Sink also uh, Wanhira Matai, the Vice President and Regional uh, Director for Africa at the World Resources Institute, by Marco Bizarri, the CEO of, uh, from Gucci, and Roberto de Oliveira Marquez, uh, the CEO and Executive uh, Chairman of uh, the Board of uh, Natura. We will also have the honor to have uh, Mr. Al Gore, the former Minister of the United States and Chairman and co-founder of uh, Generation Investment Management, who will be sharing with us uh, his closing, uh, with closing remarks. Together, we will discuss the element needed to spur our economy towards a decade of action that is sustainable and equitable uh, for all. Uh, you can ask um, any question to our panelists uh, to share them with us in the chat box. We'll do our best to, uh, to try to cover them in time. Um, and, and we will um, have, for your information, a second uh, segment for discussion in today's session. So let's, uh, uh, let's now move on uh, to the heart of um, our subject. And, and let me bring you know, a couple of things that I tend to believe that are extremely important because you know the triple crisis that, that we've been confronted today, the pandemic, nature, and, and climate are totally in, interconnected. Uh, looking back uh, on 2020, uh, it has been a you know a very complex uh, and difficult year to all of us, to all of us. But we've been able to really have a clear understanding that uh, uh, nature, uh, the nature and climate solution uh, requires uh, a lot of policy policy coherence, but as well the coherent uh, action within all countries. Uh, this last year has uh, not only seen devastating uh, uh, rise on global pandemic, uh, but it also has been an unprecedented year for climate in nature. You know, the, the, the U.S. and the Caribbean with its uh, record-breaking hurricane season counting over $16 million weather events here, in 2020, it's just, just one example. What uh, Central America went last November, particularly the, the two big hurricanes in, in less than two weeks, uh, really had a strong impact on the on Nicaragua and Honduras, and, and it is very, very concerned and worrisome. So the longer we wait, the worse and costlier <laughs> this event will become. It is no surprise that uh, in that in 2020, the World Economic Forum Global Risk Report has found for the first time in 15 years that the top five global risks facing humanity come from a single category, the environment. The 2021 report released uh, just last week shows that global businesses and economic leaders still see top risk as being environmental. But this year, they have also added the elements on the pandemics uh, to that uh, top list. And we know that uh, in many ways uh, are linked uh, to the destruction of uh, natural capital. They are linked in this dysfunctional uh, relationship uh, within uh, humans and nature. Yet, 
there is an opportunity to use this year as a turning point and a big call to bring nature and climate agendas and goal together is a major responsibility uh, for all of us. The World Economic Forum has just released a, a white paper which has confirmed that even when taking economic and biophysical constraint into account, nature-based projects can deliver as much as a third of, a, of uh, reductions needed to be on track uh, with the 1.5 uh, uh, climate target. Hi, uh, uh, hi, I need to highlight as well the opportunity for stakeholders to help us really to deliverage as we come in now the 2021, the super year for environmental decisions as, uh, um, at, as the three Rio Convention, the Climate Change Convention, the Certification of Biodiversity Convention will have that year meetings of the parties and will set the uh, environmental, uh, the political framework for action in the next uh, decade. So I will um, turn over to our panelists and I will um, make uh, each one a very specific question. I will ask uh, panelists uh, to be able to do their best to uh, respond uh, in three minutes. So I will begin with uh, our commissioner uh, from, from the EU. Uh, from the EU. Um, commissioner, oh, well, the EU Green Deal has set four uh, ambitious targets. It's really requires a systematic change uh, to meet our climate and biodiversity goal. What can the private sector do to support your policy in terms of ambitions? And what are you doing to mainstream and, and enable this agenda across all sectors? Commissioner, the floor is yours. Carlos, thank you very much uh, for your question. And of course, uh, it's a great privilege to be on, 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 on such panel. Uh, so good afternoon to everyone. Answering your question, first of all, I would say that the natural resources and ecosystems that power businesses and underpin economies and communities, they are under huge strain. And to continue to create value for our economies and ensure a decent life for, for citizens around the globe, we must take care of this natural capital and keep the value chain of nature healthy. So businesses must take their responsibilities and be part of the solution. Uh, for this, it is essential for the corporate decision makers to value nature and help regenerate. It. So today's management information systems in, in, in companies focus on financial performance. They are not adequately accounting for the relation with nature. The information on the business dependencies on nature is not reaching the boards nor it is shared with customers and investors. And yet by now, there is growing consensus that natural capital is the bedrock of our economy and society. It provides the land and, and resources essential for our economy. Economic studies show that green investments are generating profits in short and in long run, and they are powerful engines of job creations. So this is why uh, the EU recovery plan is geared to investing in green recovery. Our EU biodiversity strategy stresses that biodiversity considerations uh, need to be better integrated into business decision making. In particular, measuring the environmental footprint of products and organizations on the environment is a necessary shift expected from business decision makers. And we need more aligned approaches and generally accepted principles to account for natural capital and biodiversity. So the Green Deal and biodiversity strategy will facilitate, uh, I would name four uh, points. First of all, uh, we are revising the sustainable finance strategy and the non-financial reporting directive with a view to improving the quality and scope of non-financial disclosures, including on environmental aspects. Secondly, we are working on an initiative on, on, on green claims, enabling better informed choices by customers based on robust assessment methodologies. Thirdly, uh, the EU business and biodiversity platform is looking at biodiversity measurement approaches with a special focus on the needs of uh, SMEs. And fourth, through our projects, transparent uh, and 
align. We are engaging with front-running companies to harmonize natural capital and biodiversity approaches based on already their experience on the ground. So I'm truly happy to see many front-running corporate boards uh, realizing the importance of assessing, valuing, and of course, accounting for companies' impact and dependencies on natural capital and ecosystem uh, services, and how this translates into financial risk. And it is no longer niche markets. Uh, market leaders actually demonstrate the need to integrate biodiversity to their strategy, and they actually begin it in practice. Uh, business coalitions uh, like Business for Nature, uh, One Planet Business for Biodiversity, or the Value Balancing Alliance uh, pilot, ways to integrate uh, nature into, into business decision making. Uh, the Business for Nature coalition points uh, to over 500 front-running businesses that have already made uh, commitments to help uh, reverse nature loss. More than uh, 1,200 companies are acting for nature by reducing their negative impacts, uh, investing in protecting and restoring nature. Uh, Forward-thinking businesses understand that, that healthy societies, resilient economies, and businesses, they all rely on nature. Uh, but we need a broader business movement uh, to rally behind. So to realize that, that nature is everyone's business and, and we are all uh, dependent on it. Thank you for that, Commissioner. Uh, and let me add another question here, that the EU Green Deal was a great uh, political achievement. It will be great that uh, the EU can support all the regions of the planet E, generate the same level of political agreements and ambition. But my, my, my third, second question is the following. The, the EU has a, is a, is a huge market, one of the biggest markets in the planet. That means it has a big global environmental footprint. Is the EU Green Deal uh, aiming for sustainability efforts uh, within the supply chains? Uh, absolutely. Uh, the Green Deal cannot uh, be reached if it's not uh, implemented uh, across the whole value chain. And uh, either we look at the deforestation problem or we look in, in trade at trade in general, uh, the Green Deal has to be, you know, a, a core part of it. Uh, and I'm truly proud and, and, and happy to say that when one year ago we rolled out a Green Deal initiative and we said that it's going to work only if it's uh, implemented uh, horizontally across all the sectors, we received quite a lot of critique and, 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 uh, and uh, from different uh, communities. Business, of course, among them. Now, uh, only a year into this journey, we find ourselves uh, as having a first mover's advantage, but most importantly, uh, our company is joined by even more ambitious ones. Uh, other uh, countries, uh, recent changes in in, in, in US, uh, and it seems like uh, we draw a very clear uh, roadmap to our businesses, not only predicting uh, 10 years ahead or uh, 20, but up to 2050, basically, what we're going to do and which path we're going to take. And of course, in order for that change to happen, to reach the main goal of, 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 of um, the carbon neutral economy, that has to be implemented uh, across all the sectors. And uh, to finalize, we speak quite a lot about the climate change, and I feel that a uh, great job has been done uh, to put a uh, climate message uh, across the, 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 the decision makers uh, uh, in general, across the, 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 the public. Uh, but we need to do much more on biodiversity. Uh, and I'm happy that today we're addressing it so much. We're speaking it about how it can be become part of the language of, uh, of boards uh, across the biggest uh, companies. And then I think the change is going to happen. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Commissioner. So let me now move over to, to, uh, with uh, Wahida Matai. Hello. Um, and you've been a prominent voice uh, for environmental change in Africa for the last uh, many decades. Uh, so from your perspective, how has COVID-19 impact the achievement of uh, net zero nature positive development in Africa? And 
what actions are needed to ensure that the incoming decade of action is sustainable and equitable to all. Now, Juanita, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, thank you, everybody. Delighted to be here. Listen, COVID-19 has impacted everyone. I think there is not a situation that we all remember in recent memory where economies have been brought simply to their knees. There is no telling what the impact will be because we have to remember we are still in the COVID crisis. But I have to say that for the African continent, it is frightening to think about the disruptions in key sectors that continues to happen. And we know now from the, the data that are coming out from the Economic Commission and everywhere else that extreme poverty, which has been on the decline for so many years, 22 years, this will be the first time in 22 years that we see an increase in extreme poverty. So this is extremely devastating for African countries and Af the African economies. This at the time when Africa is urbanizing faster than any sector in any continent in the world, and also the youngest continent in the world, average age 19. And I always want to remember that all of that can be either a, a great uh, advantage for Africa or a potent um, a recipe for disaster. And I think COVID has just made a lot of things worse. But I'm also inspired by the fact that we know the, the good news is that restoring landscapes and what COVID has taught us is that we have got to take care of our natural um, ecosystems and we've got to revitalize grasslands and a host of other nature-based solutions that we now know will cushion us. Many knew, but now we are certain the data also says 7 to $30 in benefits for every dollar invested. So what else are we waiting for? I think the good news here is that as we start this critical year, decade of action, there are clear indications that nature-based solutions are finally getting the prominence and visibility they deserve. Just this year alone, here we are, the World Economic Forum prioritizing this agenda, COP26 at the center of this agenda. The COP15 Kunmin Biodiversity COP will focus on this. The G20s countries have put this and on and on. The Climate Adaptation Summit just ended, the One Planet Summit. I belabor the point. This is the first time that it is on the top of everybody's agenda. So in, our, in my mind, we have to do four things. Four things have to happen and they have to happen together. We've got to produce our food more efficiently. We've got to produce in a more regenerative way because 30% of our food is actually going to waste and we are, our populations are on the rise. For Africa, an important thing to remember is the gendered nature of production uh, of food in particular. We have 80% of food consumed in less industrialized countries is actually produced by small-scale farmers, 70% of whom are women. So we've got to look at this very carefully. And so simply put, women are the backbone of our rural agricultural economy, which holds everything together. They're, they're the guardians of our food security. The second thing we have to do is to protect. We have to protect standing forests. Almost every week, there's new evidence coming out that standing forests are incredibly important, that we cannot compromise the fact that those are the key lungs of this planet. We have 40% of climate change mitigation coming from these existing ecosystems. We've got to pr protect them like our lives actually depend on them. And so that is one of the key pieces of our uh, of our protection agenda. The other thing we must do is reduce. This is the, uh, the big word of our, of our year is ambition. We've got to cut down on the emissions we put into the atmosphere, especially for the big emitters, the major economies. We are so delighted the U.S. is back because we need that solidarity and their leadership because this critical decade does not have much time to waste. But I also want to mention the importance of the circular economy, reducing waste, reducing, how, uh, reducing and being more efficient in how we produce and use. I was struck by 
uh, a statistic recently that 90 tons of material is used to meet the functions of human beings every single uh, in in a year and yet only nine tons of that a tenth is actually cycled back into the economy really scary what happens to the 90 percent of waste out there we've got to reduce a lot more um, strictly. Now, the third and the fourth and final thing we've got to restore. This is one of the areas of work that I have committed my life to so for so long, that we have got to plant the right trees in the right places. That is a top priority for many nations. We've got to restore using all manner of other interventions. The Great Green Wall received a lot of attention recently. We've got to make sure that we restore degraded landscapes. Carlos, we want things to look like that image behind you, because we know that natural forest restoration is still the best thing if we do it right. We've got to make sure that we involve local communities so that it is part of a locally led initiative. Right locations, and we actually plant the right vegetation. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, uh, th thank you, Juanita. And, and, and let me come up with a 30-second follow-up question. How, how do you think Africans uh, can protect uh, their forests while they're dealing with this human crisis when the market only sends wrong signs to major decision makers in terms of, you know, land use change and the benefit of land, uh, land use change? What is the approach? What is the data? How do we deal with this situation? Because I, I fear that the human crisis will take us very soon to where we were before the pandemic. Well, Carlos, the good news is that even for African economies, we are finding out that it actually makes business sense. This is not just a good thing to do. The new climate economy analysis in Ethiopia, in Indonesia, in Brazil has made it very clear. It is better for our economies when we have our forests intact and we can actually engage, use them. That the services that we have so undervalued over time that come out of ec these ecosystems, water, food, energy, the climate mitigation and adaptation properties of these forests far outweigh our using them, and especially the critical areas, that we have to be smarter. And so the analysis that are coming out, and if, if anyone is interested in the new climate economy, have made a very strong case. And we are seeing African countries now say, absolutely. In fact, this is the only hope we have to cushion ourselves against future um, devastating impacts. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh... Now I move over, uh, over to our next uh, panelist, uh, Marco Bizzari. Marco, uh, nice to see you. It's great um, to see how Gucci is uh, leading the fashion industry. Nevertheless, uh, there's um, a lot of room uh, for improvement in terms of the impact of the industry on climate and, 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 and nature. And, um, you just uh, released a, a, a very ambitious uh, climate strategy with goals on regenerative agriculture and supply chains, uh, sustainable supply chains. Uh, could you explain how can the fashion industry and companies as, uh, as Gucci and others uh, can be part of a need zero, a need zero uh, nature positive economy? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks a lot for allowing me to, uh, to go through what we are trying to, to do at Gucci. I mean, as, as we all know, I mean, the fashion industry is representing more or less 10% of the global emission. So it's the second most polluting industry, is, uh, industry of the entire world. Um, and, uh, and for this, um, of course, we are under scrutiny every single day. So if you look at it with a different angle, we can leverage that in order to make sure that the people understand what can be done. Uh, because, I mean, having all this reach uh, that we have as a, as, a, as a brand, with the visibility that we have and uh, reaching so many consumers, what we do matters. So in the way in which we do it through our social platform, digital platforms can really amplify the activities that we can do in terms of brand, in terms of corporate activities. So um, if you think about it, we are in touch with uh, many, many uh, different supply chain and industries because we are in touch with agriculture, with mining, with forestry, with food because we get from that the cotton, we get the leather, we get the, we get the viscose, we get the precious stones. So in a way, where we can really do something as a company that works in the fashion industry. The idea is very much to, to do it 
in the places where you can impact the most, where you can control what you do, because I mean, our supply chain is something that we can really work on. So the idea is really much to try to find a way where biodiversity meets business, because business is the one that for us should drive the change going forward, not vice versa. So if we use this and knowing all the possibility that we have as a big company to, um, uh, to foster this kind of attention in all these, the, the other actors of the this, of this situation and making sure that people understand that uh, nature is not just a victim of the situation, but can be an actor of the change. I mean, shifting from a, from a perspective standpoint, this kind of I mean, situation. I think the idea that we had in, in, in terms of moving forward uh, for the, our strategy is the following. We decided to go entirely carbon neutral in, back in 2018. So following what just, I mean, my pan, the other panel said just now, we try to avoid, we try to reduce uh, we try to restore. But at a certain point, uh, Gucci this year is going gonna, is gonna to accomplish the 100th anniversary, anniversary. So the structure and the business model is something that has been built uh, from a long time. So technology processes and all the rest cannot be solving completely the problem. So we are still a mission that needs to be uh, offset because offset is the, the, the last thing that you can do. Keeping in mind that as the commissioner was saying before, you need to monitor, you need to calculate what is your impact. From 2015, Gucci started to do the environmental profit and loss that is published in our, uh, in our site, where everybody can see where our impact, our footprint is going to be impacted, because that is absolutely key. Otherwise, we talk about nothing. We talk about air. So all the KPIs as well that our um, uh, direct reports and myself as well are monitored and, and rewarded at the end of the year, and not just financial, but also from a sustainability standpoint. So the idea has been Okay, let's, let's move from just to be carbon neutral. So in scope one, scope two, and scope three of the greenhouse protocol. So meaning the entire supply chain uh, that is, is the one that is, is giving more than 90% of the impact on the gas emission to regenerative agriculture. The idea is to move in three steps. So the first one is continue to protest, protect environment. So to protect forest, because that is absolutely key. Otherwise, I mean, as we, as we, we were saying in, in, previously, that is, is going to be something that is going to impact uh, for us the most. The most. Then beyond offsetting um, and, and protecting, the idea is to protect mangroves. Mangroves are, are retaining ten, more than 10 times more than the trees uh, carbon emission, so that we are working different projects in Honduras, in Nicaragua, et cetera, et cetera, in Patagonia, in order to make sure that uh, all these activities in terms of forest, in terms of mangroves, have an impact. And then we are setting up a project in the supply chain uh, for regenerative agriculture. On one end, we start sourcing regenerative materials ourselves for our products, because that is key for all the circularity that we, we, can, we can put in place as a company. And also, we, are, we need to support this farm transitioning from chemical intensive farming to something that is regenerative farming, because this can help as well to create a new business model, new mm -hmm. revenue stream for these people. And of course, we always, at the end, we always talk about business. So we are able to convince or to finance, especially at the beginning, as we are doing with this offsetting that we are doing, pre-buying carbon credits from these farmers, they are able to invest or to reinvest with credits in, the, in, 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 their, in their farms in making sure that the, the top soil is going to be more healthy in order to create something that we can use that is going to be more healthy and, uh, and also absorbing carbon emission and not just reducing the, 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 the emission itself. So this is what we are doing. This is what we are doing, and we try to, to go fast in this uh, situation. Uh, oh, way. congratulations for this, uh, uh, Mark, and this is very interesting. How, how much does uh, the private sector needs for governments through public policy in terms of leveling the economic playing field as, a, as enabling conditions for upscaling and amplifying what the, you, your sector and the private sector is doing? Uh, can, can you, I, I lost so, I do, do, your question. Yeah. How much does the private sector depends on public policy for the effort of uh, leveling the economic playing field so all sectors will have the right policies so we can go from, you know, negative incentives that you, 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 you know, today we normally see into positive ones. 
Listen, if, if you were asking me this question like one year ago, I would have, I would have told you that very likely the private sector could have done that by, by itself. But after the pandemic and the impact on the supply chain, I mean, there are so many um, companies that are in trouble, I mean, debts, et cetera. So uh, going there, there now to ask them to invest in, in, in regenerative agriculture is totally crazy. So you, we need to, as companies, work together with the public. And we are trying to do that in Italy, even though it's, it's not easy, uh, but to try to put together public public and private, uh, because I, mean, I, I just had a call before this call, you know, to make sure that we are able to recreate, to create a situation of a financial viability of these uh, small businesses, because, I mean, especially in Italy, I'm talking about Italy, where I mean, we, we do 100% of our production in Italy. So it, it is a, a hyper-fragmented uh, industry where the, 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 all the companies are extremely uh, weak, financially after the pandemic even more. So the, the, we, we cannot do by our, just by ourselves. So it needs to be done together. Okay, okay. So that's my point. Great, uh, Marco, thanks uh, for that. Pleasure. So let me go over now with uh, Roberto uh, Oliveira. Uh, Marquez, uh, you know, uh, Natura has uh, great bold uh, commitments uh, towards uh, science-based uh, targets and the goal of uh, net zero uh, nature positive economy. but. You know, we, we tend to see or argue that Natura is really an exception in, in, the, in, in this uh, space. Uh, what specific changes are required in the, in the policy and investor space for nature and biodiversity considerations uh, to be mainstream? Roberto, over to you. Carlos, first, uh, thank you very much for the invitation and for your kind acknowledgement of our commitments. Uh, today, I'm just representing our 40,000 associates at Natura & Co., which is a group founded by visionary individuals that, from the beginning, had this notion of business uh, having a purpose, uh, you know, that can and should be a force for good. So Natura in Brazil, Isop based in Australia, Avon in UK, and The Body Shop, uh, founded by Anita, Rod Anita Roddick uh, in the UK. We now operate over 100 countries, and we have uh, opportunity to really reach out over you know, 200 million customers, which we like also to call them citizens, because they want to be engaged. They want to be part of the solution as well. Uh, so it is a journey for us. Since 2007, uh, Natura has been carbon neutral. Uh, but late uh, last year, uh, uh, we decided to actually unveil our 2030 ambitions that we call Commitment to Life, which has three very important pillars. The first one is really to reduce carbon emission and to become net zero emission by 2030, which is just as a reference, is 20 years ahead of the commitment from the UN, right? At the same time, we want to protect the Amazon. I think we heard it today how important it is the preservation of our forests. And because Natura is based in Brazil, there is the whole Latin America, very strong relationship with the forest and with the Amazon. But we wanna go even further. We wanna talk about how we drive a business that are more inclusive, more diverse, and also trying to really reach full circularity of our packaging by 2030 with over 90% of our products and ingredients in renewable and biodegradable. It's a pretty ambitious goal. In related to the carbon emission that we want to get to net zero, it's also important to highlight that we are committing ourselves to do that both in scope one, which is our direct emissions, scope two, which is all the energy that we purchase and consume. But most challenging, we want to also get to net zero emission on scope three, which is all the emission across our supply chain end to end. What I can tell you is that in order to get to that point, I think we really need a step change in the way we're thinking about this topic. We needed a much more cohesive public sector, private sector working together. It's almost like a call to action in our view. And, and I would detail you three things that we believe are crucial for companies and for the governments uh, to be able to really reach those very daunting goes of net zero. The first one, we needed to embrace science-based target. Very important that we put science first in terms of how we are looking at those topics. Two, I think we needed to create a clear framework uh, with common metrics and indicators. Uh, it's, it's all over the place, to be honest. People are not very clear about exactly how we are measuring, what we are measuring, 
So if you can create some common ground in terms of metrics indicators, I think will help everybody move forward. And third and probably most important, transparency. We need clear mechanism of incentives, resource allocation, and accountability, both at the public sector and private sector. Uh, one of the things that we hope to achieve is for private companies and sector with the financial markets to be able to report on a regular base the progress in sustainability and carbon emission, the same way the companies report their profitability or their market share, how it's uh, creating value for the shareholders. We should be looking at all shareholders and stakeholders and thinking about how we create metrics and how we report uh, on a regular base to customers, to citizens, so they can really help us making the right choices and really funnel their resources to companies and technologies that are really moving into that direction. So it, it is a call to action in our mind. It is a step change that we needed to do in order to achieve that. And I wanna finish with one example that I think is very dear to us in terms of nature-based solution, which is the work that Natura has been doing the Amazon for 20 plus years, right? by embracing what I call the local traditional knowledge, by working directly with the local communities. Right now, we work with over 30 communities, and our goal by 2030 is to reach over 40 communities. So far, we have been able to preserve 1.8 million acres. We know that that's not much. It's half of the size of Holland. Our goal is to get to 3 million acres by 2030. But now, imagine this is just one company in one sector, cosmetic. Imagine if other companies, other sectors join this approach of really working with the communities, respecting the local knowledge, paying for the ingredients and paying for their intellectual property, for their local knowledge, establishing those relationships. I think you can really create this step change. So it is about working together with the communities, respecting the communities, respecting the forest, but really applying you know, science-based technology to make sure that for the communities, the forest standing is worth more than the devastation and deforestation. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Roberto, for that. Um, very good, uh, great. So let me please uh, <clears throat> allow me to go <clears throat> over with uh, Mr. Vice President, uh, Mr. Gore, it's a, it's a great pleasure. You, you've been in the f uh, forefront of a nature positive agenda right from the beginning. I remember, you know, your visits uh, to Costa Rica when we were pushing for Red Plus, which is the early version of what we call now nature-based solution. And, and um, your leadership uh, back then and today continues to be extremely important and critical. But even though we have made a lot of progress on all fronts uh, within the climate agenda and narrowing down the climate and the nature agenda COVID-19 uh, uh, requires us to recognize the urgency for action. So what levers need to be unlocked today, Mr. Gore, so we can help uh, the private sector in countries to decarbonize and invest in, in nature-based solutions? Uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Gore. Well, thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, and uh, to all the distinguished guests, Your Majesty King Philippe, thank you for joining us. Uh, Hilda Schwab, thank you for that amazing concert you hosted Sunday night at the beginning of the annual meeting. That was the best ever. Thank you so much. I, I can't acknowledge all of the distinguished guests. My screen is not big enough to show all of the people who are here, but uh, it's an honor to be among the uh, presenters. Uh, all of I have learned a lot from what has been said. And Wanjira, thank you for saying uh, you're glad that the U.S. is back. I can confirm the U.S. is back. As of this hour, it is just only seven days since Joe Biden has been president, and there has been an amazing uh, amount of activity. In fact, not since Franklin Roosevelt became president in 1933 has there been a faster, more competent, uh, start to a new uh, administration. It, it's just fantastic. And today, uh, President Biden I is launching a whole series of new initiatives on, on uh, climate uh, and the environment. And as for the levers you ask about, uh, Carlos, of course, natural climate solutions like uh, sustainable 
forestry and regenerative uh, agriculture and protecting uh, the web of life uh, as has, is being addressed in the COP15. Uh, We're focused on COP26 this fall, but we cannot forget about uh, uh, the UN Biodiversity uh, Conference and the ongoing uh, efforts. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, these natural climate solutions offer a, a fantastic way to reduce emissions if we go about it in a sensible and, uh, and, and deliberate uh, way. Uh, and of, of course, uh, trees represent uh, such an important uh, opportunity. Also, regenerative agriculture, because there is more than three times as much carbon in the topsoils of the world as in all the trees and vegetation, uh, put together twice as much as in the atmosphere. But of course, while we can see trees with satellites from space, we can't see the carbon underneath the ground. So we have to uh, continue developing uh, scientific ways to accurately measure and verify the buildup of soil carbon as we shift away from so much plowing and artificial uh, chemical use. And uh, uh, Sven Dori Holsetter uh, has uh, uh, is one of those in this uh, group that has pioneered uh, these solutions. I know there uh, are others. Uh, by the way, I can't respond to all of the messages in the chat thing because I've been following and making notes, but thank you all. Um, I want to uh, also uh, call our attention to the fact that we are highly vulnerable if we do not give uh, nature the attention and protection it deserves. And I would like to briefly call uh, folks' attention to a peer-reviewed paper published this morning, actually yesterday, it's in the news this morning in the peer-reviewed journal Nature Sustainability. Uh, and I want to read you one quote uh, from one of the authors of this paper. He looks, they look at the integrated assessment models that have been used to integrate uh, nature with economic activity. And he says the standard approach, and I'm quoting, looks at how climate change is damaging the fruit of the tree, namely market goods. We are looking at how climate change is damaging the tree itself. Uh, and we cannot uh, uh, overestimate the risk we are running if we allow this process of destruction to continue. Indeed, as most know, uh, COVID-19 is a zoonotic disease. We're getting five new infectious diseases every year as we encroach on previously wild areas of the world. Three quarters of them uh, are zoonotic from animals to humans. Uh, and yet we have the opportunity in protecting nature to sequester carbon. Ratan Lal, who won uh, the World Food Prize uh, last year, has estimated that the combination of uh, regenerative agriculture and uh, sequestering carbon in soils and planting trees, and congratulations to the forum for the One Trillion Tree Initiative, uh, could uh, technically pull down 150 parts per million. Now, that's not a realistic, actual, practical estimate, but it can be perhaps the largest opportunity to sequester carbon. So for all of these reasons, we have to put the focus where it belongs on natural climate solutions. Uh, again, uh, there's much more I could say, but I know we're pressed uh, for time. Uh, and I just want to congratulate uh, you, Carlos, for your leadership and the forum for presenting uh, this session. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Vice President. And I want to thank all panelists. We had a fabulous lineup uh, today. So, so uh, they've been all able to contribute uh, with the second part of uh, our activity for today. So once more, I want to thank all of the panelists uh, for the interventions.